PC エンジンニューワールドを制覇する PC エンジン全開 NEC から。Hello everyone and welcome to the Ultimate TurboGrafx-16 review here on Player One Start. If you're new to my channel or you haven't watched it yet, this is actually the second console I am covering for the 16-bit war, where I'm going to have the consoles of the 16-bit generation face off against each other to see which one was better. If you haven't seen it already, the consoles I've covered already have ironically all been the Sega Genesis. I've done the Sega Genesis console by itself, the Sega CD, and the Sega 32X, which is a 32-bit add-on, but it is going to be included in this because it requires the 16-bit Genesis to run it. In this video series, we're specifically taking a look at the TurboGrafx-16 itself, and we will cover the TurboGrafx CD, but just like we did with the Genesis, I'm going to cover that in its own video series. So that will be coming out to you after this series is over with. And before I forget, if this is your first time here or you haven't done so yet, please remember to click on that like button below if you like the video, and don't forget to click on that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when I make future posts. But that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the TurboGrafx-16. Well, really, we're actually going to take a look at something else first. We can't talk about the TurboGrafx-16 without acknowledging the PC Engine. And we're going to start taking a look at NEC as a company and how they got into the video game business to begin with. So let's go ahead and take a look. NEC was initially established as the Nippon Electric Limited Partnership on August 31st of 1898. This partnership was established with the purpose of production, sales, and maintenance of telephones and switches. Prior to World War II, the company gained prominence in Japan by becoming the leading manufacturer and servicer of telephone equipment for the Ministry of Communications in Japan. Starting in 1924, NEC moved into the radio communication business, with Japan's first radio broadcaster, Radio Tokyo, being founded in 1924, and started broadcasting in 1925. They started importing radio equipment at the beginning, but by 1930 they were building their own radio transmitters. Phototelegraphic equipment developed by NEC transmitted photos of the ascension ceremony of Emperor Hirohito. Two newspapers were competing to cover the ceremony. While each initially wanted to use a different method, both ended up using the NEC product due to its faster transmission rate and higher picture quality. World War II was described by the company as being the blackest days of its history. In 1938, some of its plants were placed under military control, with direct supervision by military officers. In 1939, Nippon Electric established a research laboratory in one of their plants. It became the first Japanese company to successfully test microwave multiplex communications. On December 22, 1941, the enemy property control law was passed. This allowed the Japanese government to seize any shares of NEC that were owned by competing foreign powers. And in October of 1943, the munitions company law was passed, placing overall control of NEC plants under military jurisdiction. Throughout the rest of the war, many NEC plants would be heavily damaged or completely destroyed by bombing attacks, heavily reducing their production. After the war ended in 1945, production was slowly returned to civilian use. NEC reopened its major plants by the end of January 1946. Beginning in 1950, NEC began transistor research and development. It started exporting radio broadcast equipment to Korea under the first major post-war contract in 1951. This would be the first of many cross-country communication projects that they would engage in all throughout the 1950s. In September of 1958, NEC built their first fully transistorized computer, with parts made solely in Japan. The computer was the NEAC-2201. It was comprised of a computer main unit, a console and input-output device, such as a paper tape punch typewriter, and a photoelectric tape reader. Germanium alloy high-speed transistors were used as circuit elements and a magnetic drum was used for the internal memory unit. 
Throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, NEC would continue to expand into satellite communications and computer production. Towards 1978, NEC had expanded their production into America by opening a production plant in Dallas, Texas to manufacture telephone systems, as well as acquiring Electronic Arrays, Inc. of California to start semiconductor chip production in the United States. In 1981, entering the home PC market, NEC introduced the 8-bit PC-8800 series computer, followed by the 16-bit PC-9800 series in 1982. With these products, NEC quickly became the dominant leader of the Japanese PC industry, holding an 80% market share. It was also during this time that NEC changed its English company name to NEC Corporation. In 1984, NEC Information Systems Inc. started manufacturing computers and related products in the United States. That same year, NEC released the V-Series processor, which was a reverse-engineered, PIN-compatible version of the Intel 8088 processor with an instruction set compatible with the 8186. This processor would be used in PC clones such as the Commodore PC-compatible systems, as well as the Tandy 1000 series. In 1987, NEC Technologies Limited was established in the United Kingdom to manufacture VCRs, printers, and computer monitors, as well as mobile telephones for Europe. But something else also happened that year. NEC had collaborated with Hudson Soft, who created video game software, to create a video game console. NEC lacked the vital experience in the video game industry, and so they approached numerous video game studios for support. By pure coincidence, NEC's interest in entering the lucrative video game market coincided with Hudson's failed attempt to sell designs for their then-advanced graphics chips to Nintendo. The two companies successfully joined together to develop the new system. On May 18, 1973, Brothers Yuji and Hiroshi Kudo decided to found a company together. As both of the founders grew up admiring trains, they decided to name their business after their favorite, the Hudson Locomotives. And it was then that Hudson Soft LTD was founded. Hudson began as an amateur radio shop called CQ Hudson, selling radio telecommunication devices and art photographs. Yuji Kudo had originally planned to start a coffee shop, but there was already one in the same building so the decision was made to change to a wireless radio shop at the last moment. Although both of the brothers had a college education, neither had studied business management. And because of their inexperience, as well as the difficulty of trying to find trustworthy people to run their company, Hudson Soft was almost always in the red during each month of its operation early in its life. In 1975, Hudson Soft began selling personal computer-related products and in 1978, they started developing and selling video game packages. At that time, many amateur radio shops were switching to selling computers because they dealt with the same electronic equipment. Starting at this time and into the early 1980s, Hudson Soft favored quantity over quality in their marketing of video games. At one point, the company released up to 30 different computer software titles per month. However, none of them achieved huge success. This would change in late 1983, when Hudson started to prioritize quality over quantity, becoming one of Nintendo's first third-party software vendors for the family computer. Their first title, Load Runner, sold 1.2 million units after its 1984 release. As the company continued developing video games for the Famicom and other computer platforms, including the MSX, NEC PC-8801, and ZX Spectrum, among others, the company was reorganized as Hudson Soft Co. Limited. Hudson Soft continued to find success with the release of Bomberman for the Famicom, which was again considered another big hit by Hudson Soft. But partially due to the fact that the company was founded by two brothers who had very little business management experience, Hudson Soft was always trying out and trying to develop new things. As their first American employee stated, that though the company made a few mistakes, 
Basically, they did things that were always different, strange, weird, wonderful, and wild. Going on to say that the company was a real game company as opposed to a marketing company. Also early in the Famicom's life cycle, Hudson had teamed up with Sharp and Nintendo to create Family Basic. This was a cartridge that basically turned the Famicom into a full computer system. It was bundled with a computer-style keyboard and came with an instructional textbook. This allowed consumers to code their own programs or games into the system and save them to a Famicom data cassette recorder. As Nintendo had partnered with them to make this peripheral for the system, it was said that that's why they thought they could design Nintendo's next system. However, when Nintendo expressed no interest in their design, they would continue to seek out other companies to try to build the hardware, as they were not large enough to manufacture its own console. Hudson would also approach companies like Sega and other video game companies before they would eventually partner with NEC. Hudson had previously built productivity software for NEC's PCs, so the two had a pre-existing relationship. However, all through the life of their new venture, there would be conflict between NEC and Hudsonsoft, at least in terms of direction for their new system. Hudsonsoft made a push to release a lot of original software for the system, while NEC frequently would release ports of games from other platforms. As Hudson came up with the hardware's design, Hudson got a royalty for every PC engine manufactured. And because they also designed the Hue card format, they also got a royalty from NEC for every single Hue card sold as well. This would make the deal very lucrative for Hudson Soft as they assumed none of the risk of paying for manufacturing and marketing. Instead, this would put NEC at an instant disadvantage, as they had to cover the costs, all while paying royalties to Hudson. But since NEC saw the very lucrative success that Nintendo was having in the video game market, NEC accepted the terms, expecting to make a huge profit regardless of these conditions. After they struck a deal, they began working on a rival console to Nintendo's Famicom around 1985 to 1986. The results would be named the PC Engine. The name was actually derived from NEC's successful PC range, which was named the PC-88 and the PC-98, respectively. It was developed to be a more powerful alternative to the Famicom and the Sega Mark III. NEC would make the hardware, and Hudson Soft would make the software. As Nintendo were yet to announce a successor to its aging console, the plan was to take the lion's share of the video game's market and it would make its debut in the Japanese market on October 30th of 1987 and was met with a tremendous amount of success. Its success has been contributed to a few factors. First was the widely recognized brand that was NEC in the Japanese PC marketplace. Another was that the PC Engine had an elegant, eye-catching design. And it was very small, especially when compared to its rivals. This, combined with a strong software lineup and third-party support from high-profile developers such as Namco and Konami, gave NEC a temporary lead in the Japanese market. Within the first month of its release, over 500,000 PC engines were sold. It went on the following year in 1988 to become the best-selling console in Japan, dethroning Nintendo and fending off challenges from Sega in its Master System and Mega Drive consoles. Following this success and looking towards the future, NEC went about creating a CD add-on known as the CD-ROM 2, which made the PC Engine the first game console to support CD-ROM technology. By April of 1989, the PC Engine had acquired 50% of new console sales in Japan, with over 1.5 million units sold overall. With this leading success in Japan over Nintendo and Sega, NEC would set their sights on the North American video game market. One thing I want to reiterate before we keep going forward is the fact that the PC Engine was number one in Japan, at least in 1988-1989, over Sega and Nintendo. 
The reason why I want to reiterate this point is because that was not the case with the TurboGrafx-16 in the United States. So let's go ahead and take a look at this neat little machine. So the system I have is actually the Core Graphics 2, which was designed after the Core Graphics 1 and the original PC Engine. From my understanding, the original Core Graphics came out at about the time of the Super Graphics release, which was the original successor to the PC Engine. However, after its commercial failure, they redesigned the Core Graphics into the Core Graphics 2. And despite the revisions, there really isn't much cosmetically different between this and the original PC Engine apart from some of the colors. The console still presents its small and sleek look, one controller port, as well as the card slot. On the back there is an expansion bay where you can hook up the Super CD2, which unfortunately is to date still missing from my collection. On the side there is an AC power adapter port, which thankfully is compatible to standard sizes here in the US. As long as you can find a power adapter that will convert the voltages correctly, you can plug this in to a North American outlet. On the side opposite of the AC power adapter is the DIN socket for AV out. This is definitely preferable to the original RF out which does not always work with American televisions. Thankfully this console puts out an NTSC 60Hz signal which is compatible with my TV. And despite this being a Japanese console, everything on the front seems to be written in English. Another thing I find kind of appealing about this console is how much smaller it is compared to the North American version. This thing is very sleek and is definitely the smallest of all of my retro game consoles from this time period. The only criticism I have of this design is the fact that it only has one controller port. But the controller itself is actually designed really well. It doesn't break the mold from something like the Sega Master System, by only providing four buttons, as well as the directional pad. For me, however, the biggest improvement over other controllers of the time is the built-in turbo control that is split up so you can have two different buttons on two different turbo settings. I find this function particularly helpful with the shooters that were common of the time. I don't know how many times on the NES I wished that I had a turbo controller, because games at the time would force you to press the button every time and it wears your hands out very quickly. I didn't run into this issue as much on the PC Engine as a result of these turbo controls. And lastly I will talk about the physical media the games came on. While this format is not a stranger to me as I had a Sega Master System that came with the Sega card, which is strikingly similar to this design, it nevertheless still amazes me that they were able to fit games on these cards considering that every other game cartridge of the time was a lot bigger. I do find the packaging a bit strange as these cases are exactly the same size and dimension as audio CD cases, but the inside is designed differently and it seems like they just added on a little clip to hold the card in place so it wouldn't move around inside of this case. I do wonder if this was more of a marketing decision that people would more likely buy these if it already looked like other media they purchased? or if this was purely a cost-saving measure by using mostly materials they already had for their CD-ROM manufacturing. Either way, it does do a good job, and as a retro collector, I do appreciate that the games utilize a standard size package that can be easily fit on the shelf. However, for games that don't come with the full case, I am easily able to put them into baseball card sleeves due to their size being almost consistent with that media as well. And while I do like the overall design of everything here, the only thing that would get a major overhaul before it got to the United States was the console, as the controllers would just get a different color scheme to match the console, and the game cards would just get a different name to appeal more to Americans. So, why do I even own a PC Engine, and why am I taking time to talk about it in the Ultimate TurboGrafx-16 review? Well, there are a few reasons for this, but first, it's because it had a much bigger impact than the TurboGrafx-16 ever did, at least in terms of the Japanese game market. That said, that meant that there were a lot more games released for the system in Japan, including a lot of exclusives that I want to play. And if I want to play those on my TurboGrafx-16, I would have to buy some sort of converter or another device to actually play the games on there, 
and that adds an additional expense when I could just be playing it on a PC Engine. But I think the biggest reason why I got a PC Engine overall was the fact that I was able to find one before I found a TurboGrafx-16, at least one that was affordable. This game was leaps and bounds cheaper, and I found out that even importing games from Japan is cheaper than buying the same games for the TurboGrafx here in the United States. So my options are very limited with the TurboGrafx-16, where the PC Engine is not. And it didn't take much, in fact the stuff that I got it with already made it work inside of the US. I didn't have to worry about voltages, I don't have to worry about trying to find that weird channel 95 that Japanese RF signals used. It just works here with a regular composite output and the power adapter that came with it, at least for me. So that said, that is one of the reasons why I own a PC Engine, and I would recommend one before I would recommend a TurboGrafx-16, and that's mainly due to expense. That said, it's actually going to wrap it up for this video. In the next part, we're going to transition back to the TurboGrafx-16 as we talk about the hardware redesign for the United States and the technology specifications. So stay tuned for that part coming out to you real soon. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Uh...